Okay, I'm going to do the introduction then because that's apparently how professionals do it. Um, this is uh, actors talk about themselves. Um, and uh, my guest today is uh, none other than Mr. Protein Shake himself, Gray McTavish. Um, and we've had a few of these uh, so far, and you know, they've always been. I like to keep them casual and raw and real, like real conversations. But at the same time, um, you know, try to keep them, uh, you know, above board and appropriate. And I feel we're going to completely bash that. Um, yeah, that's that, not that stand. That's not going to happen today. No, at all, is it? no, no. It's a, it's a shame that you set yourself such high standards because um, really, that's it's destined to fail. <laughs> yeah. But welcome, my friend. <laughs> yeah. No. It's great to great to great to be here. Sorry if this is moving around a bit. Yeah. I'm sitting on the edge of the bed. Yeah. In, in uh, because it's the only quiet place in the house at the moment. I've, yeah. There's some bloke hammering in downstairs. Um, yeah. Uh, and um, and yes, it's just too too busy. No. Yeah. yeah. Fair enough. And it's yeah, it's lovely to have you there in your own house. Um. Now we uh, when was the first time? I don't know. The first time we met, it would have been. We it would have been at one of the get-togethers. I remember talking to. Oh, John. Well, it would have been the first get-together. It would have been January the 15th, 2011. Yeah. I have a very strange memory for dates like that. Dates that are so traumatic yeah. that I'll never forget them. So, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, January the 15th, because I've had to tell my therapist that so often. <laughs> <laughs> when did you When did you first meet Stephen Hunter? Yeah, the man who's ruined your life. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, that was, the fir- that was the first time. Yeah, that was the first time, and... And probably one of the few times that I saw you out of makeup as well. Right. Um, because I think we all worked out that during the run of the filming... Well, you we worked out other because you're a train spotter. Makeup. Yeah, yeah. We saw each other in makeup more than we saw each other out of makeup. Yeah. How many times were you in makeup? Oh, I think I, um, I worked it out. It was something over 200 days... 220 something like that yeah yeah i, I think, think i was uh richard was sl- slightly more and then i think it was jed jed was actually way up there in but, terms of days in makeup but jed's jed loves it so much i mean i called him the other day and he was still in makeup so <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's... I mean, applying he, it himself. Well, he, he's purposely he goes for jobs. How can I put myself through more pain? And he—that's why he did Shannara. I, 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 I'll yeah. put myself in even more makeup because but obviously did, the dwarf makeup wasn't enough for him. Didn't didn't Jed when he was doing Lord of the Rings actually once go home in makeup and sleep in it? Uh, yeah, and the pillow stuck to his head. That's right. That's <laughs> it's absolutely true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that well, was the days of six-hour makeup. I, I, I know some people still do the full body ones. Yeah. yeah, I think yeah. I was about 167. Um, right. Yeah, because I, I remember that because I was, like most people, I'd only read, and I think the first thing I read of yours was a, was it an interview or something you did with the One Ring or, or, or something? You, you did an online interview, and um, I just remember reading this and going, oh, my God, this guy has done so much preparation. The, the world's shortest interview, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, you've disappeared. Um, yeah, I I I, uh, I left you when you were just taking a great big drink of your protein shake. So obviously the the the, the massive rush of protein in your system did something mm. to the electrics in your house because it just completely <laughs> it, it completely took us took us out. Um, <clears throat> I can't see you, Steve. Where are you? I'm here. Oh. Okay, I'll just have to take your word for it. Trust me, I'm taking my clothes off. So uh... <laughs> I am naked from the waist down. <laughs> yeah, me too. Obviously, that was part yeah. of the deal. It was part of the arrangement. That was a contractual That's... thing. No, I was, exactly. I, I was saying that I remember the first thing I read. You did an interview with the One Ring or something like that, yeah. and it was in such detail, and you had so much information on your characters, and you did so much physical training. And I just re- looked at it and going. Oh my! You know, I was I was probably I was probably sitting at my computer eating a pie or something. You were, at the you time. were, you were almost certainly eating a pie. Yeah, yeah, just just looking at the cover of the book that I probably hadn't read and just going pie monthly. Yeah, pie monthly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> but no, so I, I did I did do a lot of preparation. Yeah, 
Did, did you do that, I mean, you know, as soon as you got it, or did you start doing all that prep even before you got that role? No, well, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I'd been training. I'd, I'd been training for years one way or another, but as soon as I got, quite literally, I got the call on uh, September the 6th, 2010, hmm. um, and the first person I rang was my wife, Gwen, and the second person I rang was a friend of mine who was a personal trainer. <clears throat> and I immediately went and started seeing him basically five days a week for three months um, to to because I knew it was going to be absolutely horrendous uh, how tiring it was going to be. And I just wanted to be able to do do my own stuff in it and uh, not get completely knackered. And fortunately, when I arrived, we, we still had a bit about another two and a half, three months of training when yeah. we got there. <clears throat> well, it was so, ex- extended, wasn't it? It was. Yeah. 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 Which was fortunate for, <laughs> for many reasons. But uh, I mean, you, you really, um, you really hit the training hard. Uh, you were, you were one of the guys that really put in the, the hard yards on the training. I mean, there were some, some of the uh, people, you know, mentioning no names, Peter Hamilton, uh, who, uh, really were a little shy of the gym, I would say. <clears throat> well, Adam Brown had never even been in a gym. No. Or running. No. <laughs> no. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I just remember that first time when we all got together and uh, there was Martin and Richard and all of us and and we were doing, uh, like, the sword moves. Yes. Practicing the sword moves and punching and all the rest of it. And there was something fa- faintly ludicrous about it, uh, <laughs> especially when you looked around and saw, you know, people who clearly had no idea what they were doing. Mm. You know, not, you know t- appalling. I mean, if, if they had an actual fight, they would just be dead in about two minutes. <clears throat> yeah, well, because um, it's, it's all very well throwing the sword and, and, and pretending to swing the sword, but it's like stopping a sword cutting you in half. Is I think that's the key that, to it. I remember losing a, a, a boxing match late one night at a party uh, with a very good friend of mine because I've been going to boxing classes, which is all about throwing punches, but I had no idea how to defend. <laughs> <laughs> and I got absolutely pummeled. But <laughs> Really? That's funny. I think my, fav- uh-huh. my favourite part of all that training was when we had to learn to walk like dwarves. Oh uh, yeah. And then yeah. Ken's Ken Stott just goes to the toilet and Terry's like, that's it. Like that. Like Ken. That's it, Ken. The, the, and he was I mean, and he was just Ken, and he was just going to the bathroom. Ken just does walk like a dwarf. Uh, <laughs> I mean that's it. That's it's his entire life has been spent building up to that role, really, in many ways. Yeah. Uh yeah, he 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 excelled at dwarf movement. I remember everyone envied him. His ability to sit down like a dwarf and lie down. I yeah. remember his lying down was very good. He did that a lot. Um, he was he was expert at the sitting down and the lying down, I remember. <laughs> yes. Um, but again, uh, yeah, it was hard. It was it was hard to keep a straight face hmm. for doing all of that. Because <clears throat> Terry Notary was so, so enthusiastic. Hmm. And... Uh, you know, and, and what he was doing and, and how he was teaching was excellent. But as we discovered, as soon as we put the real costumes on, yeah. um, we didn't need any training at all. No. Because they just made you move like that. Yeah. You couldn't you couldn't sprint about. No, uh, I was wearing like five duvets and it was like pretty easy to, to, to get yeah. into the zone of it. Yeah, five duvets and a pair of diving boots, and yeah. uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a and a big sort of rubber helmet. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, it was it was it was. Well, you had it the worst, actually. Well, uh, see, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I've been letting everybody think that for a, a long time, um, <laughs> but but the fact is, like, my costume, I only really had one layer of clothing. Really, I had the oh, I had the suit, and the suit was quite quite immense, but it was quite soft and cushy. I didn't have all those axes that you no, had. True. Um, true. And like, did you design though? Because I know that you had, you had. I mean, you could write a book on the, on on your axes and all your bits and pieces. <laughs> did did you did you yeah. design those, or were, were they your idea? Well, <clears throat> um, I, I don't know if you remember, but we had a a session with all the guys at Weta where we went in and talked about our weapons hmm. and ideas that we had about what we would like and what would work and you know and Richard I remember Richard one of his big inputs was talking about um 
the oaken shield, uh, the actual <clears throat> bit of wood that he used mm. as a as a defensive thing. That was very much his input, and they went and designed that. And when I had the conversation, the initial one, uh, we knew that I was going to be carrying axes, but what they looked like was very much indeterminate. And mm. and I was of the view that they should look they shouldn't look fancy. Yes, that they should just look utilitarian. That these were these were weapons that were used and were practical. So mm. they weren't covered in flourishes and beautiful sort of flares on them or anything like that. It, they were they were like the axes that you would see if you were chopping wood, essentially. Yes. Yeah. And um, and so that's what we went for, and that's what they came back with with the designs. And then when we had the first big show and tell of the weapons, that's when I suggested naming them uh grasper and keeper yeah um and and really actually that suggestion uh was really only meant to be a a, a character aid for me uh, not for them to literally go away and carve those names into the axe heads <laughs> but being weta and being peter jackson uh, this was done the next day yeah and there it was the the, the detail um, the detail I, I had my i had my knife out the other day at, at um at a show and someone was like wow how did they how did they get all that i said well no they made that they made the knife and that's wood and that's bone and they make it all yep. you know from yep. from scratch <clears throat> i think my meeting um with weta went a little bit diff differently basically my weapon needed to um stir soups and casseroles at high temperatures and be able to contain a small lunch on the run that's basically what i needed <laughs> yeah 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 absolutely and it was an impressive ladle uh which came in handy. I mean, you know, you hit someone with that, that you'd know about it. Yeah, they, they it did. Uh, but yeah, the, the, de the attention to detail on everything, things that nobody would ever see, hmm. uh, the inside of the costumes, the linings, the thread, the, the, the way that the buttonholes were done, um, the choice of leather. It was, everything was agonized over. Yeah. And uh, we had multiple meetings to determine hmm. that, look because you're kind of looking back on it now you there's a, there's an assumption that um well we were always going to look like that mm. but actually that <clears throat> took quite a while yeah uh, it took months to to arrive at the exact costume that we were wearing um the exact makeup the hair mm. uh, all the tests we had i mean our noses changed size um you know the the front of our heads would change size and mm. uh, yeah yeah yeah, yeah i think Aiden, i think Aiden showing. turner's went smaller as as i believe well yes everything yes. got smaller on him yes exactly i think they actually reduced the size of his real nose yeah. um eventually <laughs> through plastic surgery so Aiden, <laughs> the real Aiden, it's, it's, it's been lost forever. He's he, uh, he's he's like he's he's completely lost. But they were <laughs> they were heavy, and what I found out towards the end of the shoot, especially in pickups, you know, and they were as they were, you know, time was of an essence. I guess that that's someone could write time was of an essence as as, as the uh, as the, the headline for that whole shoot because it was yeah. it was it was so far behind because of the prep time. But you know, I, I never forget. It was for the third movie, and I had that, that big horn that I had to blow. Oh my god! And 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 Richard came and goes. Well, I'm sorry, Stephen, um, because we've had a very short turnaround for this. Um, uh, we we're uh, we were unable to make a lightweight version of this. <laughs> <laughs> so you had to literally carry this gigantic horn. Yeah, you know, but actually, once I actually took the weight, it wasn't as bad. It was very heavy, but because it was on, it was like hanging from a wire. And if the wire wasn't bang on, you know, like the center of gravity, it was pulling me in a certain direction, and it just gave me terrible back pain. So we yeah. had to, we had to pick it up the next day, but we got it in the end. But um, oh, appalling. <clears throat> appalling, appalling. The weight, the weight of that, just yes. dear God. Yeah, I know. I mean, is is that would would you say that's been the most physically demanding, or have you done more physically demanding roles? No, 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 no. Nothing, nothing compares to the Hobbit for physical demands um i mean really it's amazing that we got through that shoot with the with so few injuries um, or deaths really. or deaths <laughs> yeah. yes. 
I mean, yeah. and just to have to clarify, yeah. just to have to clarify, our stunt and safety team were were extraordinary. Obviously, yeah, they were. They were. <clears> they were. They were absolutely extraordinary. But um, yeah, you know, just the barrels, the um, all of that sequence, um, just the running. The running alone, nobody, I don't think anybody even pulled a muscle doing that, which no. is... I sprained an ankle directly at the end of the day after I did that big run to Bayonne's house. Right at the very end of the day on the last shot, I sprained my ankle. Yeah, you would have just weakened it. You would have weakened it. Yeah. 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 No, I, I I mean, I, I managed to keep injury-free until the pickups, towards the end of the pickups, and then I, I really screwed my elbow. Um, yeah. You were in a sling like during those last few shots, those last couple of days. I remember seeing Yes, you. yes. The last two days I had a sling and I had to take it off when I was fighting. Hmm. Um, yeah, no, it was, it was, it was, it was tough, but uh, yeah, nothing, nothing even remotely compares to The Hobbit uh, yeah. for, for physical demands. I did a job, um, uh, a film called The Finest Hours and um, hmm. in that, uh, you know, we were pummeled by uh, wave machines, uh, dump tanks, wind machines, uh, all the rest of it. And I remember Casey Affleck um, just complaining about how arduous and uh, difficult it was. And I was, frankly, I was laughing. <laughs> <laughs> I was just standing next to him laughing. I said, this is nothing. Mm. You're, you're wearing your own face, Casey. You know, yes. you're not um, <laughs> you're not encased in in a duvet and diving boots. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah. No, I don't think. I do, honestly don't think. Um, I could imagine another job being as physically demanding. Mm. Uh, not not over such a sustained period. Yeah. Um, you know, two and a half years. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty insane. And, um, you know, I've been saying a few things like on the other interviews about like the it, it taught me about being physically ready, like as an actor, you know, mm. um, because really and I, I, I guess you've had this in many jobs, but it was like a it was a, an eye opener to me that no one's going to say, look, um, in two days time, you're going to be doing this running. Uh, we need to get you sort of, uh, yeah. you know, prepared for that or you need to stretch or, you know. I need to do something, you know, you need to prepare for it. It just, I mean, basically, and I guess you you found that being an actor for mm. as long as you've been, you just have to be ready for anything, don't you, really? That, that's pretty yes. much how it works. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And and no no more uh, clear an example than, um, than The Hobbit because we wouldn't be privy to what was happening um, often. Well, and... and uh, in retrospect, you know that that was the case with most departments. Mm. I mean, there were art, the art department would sometimes be bringing a set in and painting it the morning we were about to shoot on it. Yeah, uh, and you know, and Peter himself would would arrive on set sometimes and think, right, what what are we going to do today? Mm. Uh, and so you had to be flexible constantly with uh, physically and emotionally and. Uh, Wonderful uh, snapshot there of uh, Graham McTavish. Um, <clears throat> I can almost see up his nostril. That reminds me of another story. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, there we go. I was just saying yeah. I could almost see up your nostril, which reminds uh, me of the. Remi I, I've told the story a couple of times about when we were in Bag End, um, mm. and uh, and we and, and we were having a food fight, yes. and you had a you had a cunning idea to uh, feed me tomatoes, but it didn't quite work out like that, did it, Graham? No. No, no, no. Um, we were doing an extended uh, shot of food being passed around the room and plates and all the rest of it, and I was standing behind you, and I thought it would be really great if I uh, fed you tomatoes uh, while you were moving the plates and all the rest of it, and I got this cherry tomato. Fortunately, mm. it was a cherry tomato. And not a nectarine. Uh, yeah, yeah, rather than a, rather than a beefsteak tomato. That would have been pretty... <laughs> pretty painful actually mm. and i um i accidentally started ramming it up your nose mm. uh thinking it was your mouth which i don't that says something about the size of your mouth <clears throat> or yeah. the size of your nostril yeah i don't know which one yeah but i was convinced that i was inserting this tomato in your mouth and to your great credit not for a moment did you turn around and say what the hell do you think you're doing? You're ramming a tomato up my nose. You just carried on. Well, it was Dwan was, after all. Yeah, I was pushing. I got my <clears> thumb <throat> in there. Mm. I was ramming away. I mean, it could have been lodged in there. You could mm. still have it in there. Mm. Um, it, 
it was yeah but you were very good i mean you swallowed how many eggs how many eggs did you swallow? i think it was about probably about seven and a half or eight eggs in a row yeah that was a rookie mistake that was the if you if you do something and i've talked to people over this if you make a choice to do something you have to be prepared to do it over and over again and as soon well, as i started right. eating eggs i thought like, you idiot it's, it, it is a rookie mistake have you actually been to the toilet since then <laughs> no <laughs> no, no, I, I wouldn't imagine you have. No. But I, I actually had scrambled eggs for breakfast the next day. <laughs> <laughs> of course you did. Of course you did. I mean, <clears throat> breakfast, breakfast uh, in that tent was just um, a freak show, really. Because uh, it was prosthetics and no hair. Well, the, well, the, there'd be the prosthetics, no hair. There'd be us. Then there'd be orcs wandering around. There'd be Kieran Shah dressed as a sort of tiny Bilbo. There'd be uh, Paul, tall Paul, dressed as Gandalf, like this huge giant. Yeah. Um, so it was. It was like a circus. It was yeah. very strange. And then, and then um, and it, you get the elves over, sort of towards the back sometimes. Yes. <clears throat> and no, we, we, nobody would mix with anybody else. No. It was strange. The dwarves always sat together. The yeah. elves sat together, and the humans generally sat together, and the orcs. Yeah, that was so strange. It was like segregated. Someone should have done a mockumentary on like the the the, the dwarves and elves at parties. You know, like the, the good old <laughs> New Zealand twenty firsts or weddings or something, and just how they never yes. talked. See, yes. but, but, but uh, the, the biggest challenge for training and for fitness for me in that mm. whole job was the catering because it was just extraordinary. Oh, it was fantastic catering. Yes, it would have been a challenge for you. Yes, yes. Your great love of food would have um, would have made that quite difficult, actually, because it was gorgeous. But we were we were hungry all the time. Yeah, yeah. We burned off so many calories every day. Yeah, just walking around, just standing. Well, just sitting in the trailer wearing that face it was yeah. exhausting. Yeah. yeah, but then of course you did become very very good at um, uh, FIFA um, yes. football on your PlayStation. Yeah, but not as good as Aiden Bloody Turner. No. <clears throat> No, no, he did annoyingly win quite a lot, didn't he? Pretty much most mm-hmm. of the time. It was, it was me and Dean were kind of on a par, and then yeah. the Aiden, then there was Aiden, and then you had a few sort of wannabes like Martin Freeman or Freeman came in or Orlando came in, but they only really mm-hmm. played once or twice because after they got beaten, they was like they we never really saw them again. Well, this I mean, this is the side of the job that people don't really understand is that I would literally come out of my trailer sometimes, go over to your trailer, you would be huddled around your Xbox or whatever it was. Yeah. Um, you, Dean, and Aiden uh, crammed into a little corner playing this game. And then I would go off, I would do some work, film, and I would come back, <clears throat> and you were all still in exactly the same place. Yeah. And you we, hadn't moved. We got quite a few noise complaints. We got quite a few noise yeah, complaints, yeah. and I don't want to mention any names. From Ian. No, Mark Hadlow, basically. Mark, Hadlow, of course, Mark Hadlow. Beautiful yeah. Mark. We, we all love Mark. But the, and well, then, it would have inter- it would have interfered with his opera training. Well, it wasn't so much him, but it was John Bloody Callan, and like, you know, he wasn't. He didn't really complain that much, but it was. I, I don't think it was until pickups, or at least a year into the shoot, that he realised that his speakers actually go on the inside of his caravan and not <laughs> just on the outside of his caravan. Is this John Callan? Yes. Oh, the, his music, the music he used to play, just unspeakable. You know, I'm all for jazz, you know, in moderation. But I don't know who it is that he gets... Uh, I mean, that's not jazz that he was playing. Yeah, that, was, that was... No, no. But, but, I mean, they could actually use that in uh, in torture um, yeah. to get people to, to talk. <laughs> really. No, seriously, they could. I mean, it was awful, awful. But, yeah, some of it used to get a bit noisy. Yeah. Um, well, he just used to torture Mark Hadlow by doing extraordinary things, like wearing red shoes to the Royal Premier, for example. I talked to him about oh, yes. that recently. And yes. They, they... That set Mark into an apoplexy, didn't it? Yes. Do you it remember we imagined... Long... Yeah. We, we imagined that um, Mark would be so overwhelmed to meet Prince William. Yeah. <laughs> because Martin and I decided that just before he would get... <laughs> Just before Prince William would get to him, um, Mark Mark would just self-immolate, uh, <laughs> because as a sort of gesture of of loyalty and honouring the prince, he would uh, he would just do that in front of him, and but he would mistime it. <laughs> he would mistime it, and the prince would miss it, and then there would just be this pile of ash <laughs> where Mark 
was once standing <laughs> and that moment had been lost hmm. and uh, we oh boy that, that guy's got such a good sense of humor man, because we were relentless <laughs> relentless i mean that royal <laughs> premiere he, he he was almost on the point of exploding well he was um, especially with with um with with john and his red tie and his red shoes he was oh, he couldn't yeah. believe it he just thought it was an affront <laughs> a total affront yeah. but mark, mark made some mark made some quite radical clothing choices for the premiere yeah i seem to remember he came dressed as a sort of gangster to one of them yeah it was like a brown kind of pinstripe with yeah, it was still, you know. But he, um, he, he was a ridiculously well-dressed man. I just remember looking at him just going, he just pulls it off all the time. It's just it's just sickening. What, Mark? No, not Mark. Ma- I, I, Martin, uh, Martin, Martin Freeman is a ridiculously oh, well-dressed man. Martin, yeah, no, yes, I, I Mark, think I think, um, was... <clears throat> I think Mark yeah. was Mark was very uh, very very, very uh, offended when someone said he looked like a banker at the at the at the Wellington premiere. <laughs> and uh but oh, you know, but but I mean, but this is the man. This is the man that that turned up um, when we were working on set one day, wearing his uh, his naval uniform, just with, that, exactly for no, no apparent reason. And... Full full naval uniform. Yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah. No, I know. No, but Martin, Martin did. I remember the pofery mm. that we had at the start of filming, mm. and Martin, um, because people were sort of invited to maybe dress up a bit if they wanted to, mm. and of course, being New Zealand, this generally meant, you know, you'd wear your best pair of jandals and, uh, mm. you know, a, a clean Obviously. pair of shorts. Yeah. Um, and that's what most people seem to turn up in. And Martin really went to town. I mean, he was dressed immaculately in this jacket and tie with, I think it was a tie pin and a and a handkerchief. And he felt ridiculously overdressed. <laughs> he said it afterwards. He said, I had no idea that I would be the only person there wearing anything remotely smart but that but but the thing is that's such a kiwi thing to do is like i had a friend and he works in, in radio and they had the radio awards recently and um and they they told they told him everybody told him going in the joke that it was very very casual like very casual just like shorts and jandals that was the theme and he got there mm. and of course it was black tie you know no <laughs> yeah. no oh my god that's Brilliant! It's one of the. It's I went of... to see. I, I went to see a lawyer the other day in New Zealand, mm. and uh, he was dressed in a, a, a sports outfit. Um, I mean, he was he was literally wearing his favourite team's shirt and mm. shorts and a pair of um, jandals. Was he a sports lawyer? <laughs> no. I mean, it was quite an eccentric outfit. I have to be honest. <clears throat> mm. um, but hopefully, he doesn't turn up in court dressed like that. No, no, exactly. Hey, so, yeah. so so tell me, like you've um, uh, with a name like McTavish, Guy. <clears throat> you've uh, were you born in Scotland or were you born in? Yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, I was. Which part I'm of Scotland? I'm just reclining now. I'm just reclining. <clears throat> That's fine. I've had enough of trying he's, to perch. He's get, yes, okay. yes, yeah. There you go. I'm, I'm now. I've got my uh, my sort of Martian death lamp above me. It looks like uh, some sort of dental slash outdoor shower head. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Um. Yeah, Scotland. Yeah, Glasgow. Yeah. Yeah, and and yeah. when 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 did you decide that you wanted to be an actor? I mean, for me, it was about about eight years old. I, I, that was really? it. Yeah. Eight years old. Yeah. No, I had no interest in being an actor. Um, I wanted to be a writer, mm. and I did a lot of. I used to write my own comic sketches with my best friend at school, and we would perform them oh. um, to the school and other people and all the rest of it, and. Uh, and we only trusted ourselves to, to do it. <clears throat> and um, the drama teacher at the school, a guy called Des Margotson, uh, he he was always trying to get me to do a play, um, the school play. And I always said no, because I, I, I just wasn't interested. And then there was one occasion where he was, they were doing a production of The Rivals by Sheridan. Mm. And uh, the character of Bob Akers, the actor, playing that had got ill Mm. and uh his name was pete finn Mm. god i've just remembered that pete finn wow pete finn was ill and uh there were three days before the production went up and he asked me and i to this day i have no idea why i said yes i agreed i think it was probably a girl in the cast that i quite fancied or something and Usually um, usually that yes uh and i um I did it. 
I did the play and it's a comedy. And so there were laughs and then they applauded. And it was that simple. I, I thought, this is great. And so I got into amateur dramatics in the year between school and university. I joined a local uh, amateur group that operated out of the local church hall hmm. called the Priory Players. Hmm. Um, and I did plays with them. And then I went to university and did a lot at university. Uh, I was a reading... A lot of drinking. <clears throat> What's that? A lot of drinking. A lot of drinking, yes. Yes, we used to have parties in my flat in, at university just to keep the flat warm because <laughs> it was so cold. I'm, I'm really enough. not joking. That's very green. I'm really it's, it's, not it's very environmentally sound. Um, uh, it, yes, yes. So we would, we would just invite people over and we'd... Uh, We'd dance around in the lounge to warm it up. Wow. Um, yeah, it was. Uh, well, this was a place where you would leave a pint of milk on the fridge out, outside of the fridge and it would be frozen solid the next morning. Right. Yeah. 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 I used to sleep in all my clothes. Yes. Well, it's safe so... having a wardrobe, really, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I... <laughs> it's true. It's true. You don't need a wardrobe when you sleep in your own clothes. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so I did a lot of acting at university. I yeah. did a lot of Shakespeare, Jacobean drama. And in retrospect, I, I was lucky that I went to a, a college, Queen Mary College, that had such an amazing professor of English who mm. encouraged people to perform yeah. in plays. And so I did. And, um, and actually, I ended up probably doing more acting at university than I would have at drama school. Yeah. Uh, and so I didn't go to drama school. No. Um, I left and uh, I just did a one-man play, a uh, play called Crap's Last Tape, yeah. and um, toured that around pubs in East London uh, to audiences often of one. Mm. Um, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> just, I, yeah, I remember sitting in, sitting in what, what, laughably passed as the dressing room mm. uh which was essentially the toilet mm. um and Luxury. you would listen for the the footsteps coming up the stairs and that's how you'd be able to count the audience <laughs> <laughs> yeah and uh there were not many footsteps yeah no no it was it was a lonely time have you done yeah. th any theatre lately? Or, I mean, you do. You are working a lot. I mean, out, out of the cast guys, like you are, you know, you've always got a film or a TV show or something happening. Do you ever find any room for theatre? I mean, personally, I, I like doing film, TV, and and making film, and I just like I love the medium after being in, you know, doing theatre when I was younger. Yeah. So I'm just adjusting again. <clears throat> um, I haven't done a play for ten years. Hmm. Uh, and um, I really want to do another one. And I'm talking to a Scottish director mm. that I've worked with before about doing a play in Scotland mm. uh, sort of this time next year. Mm. Yeah. We'll have to look out for that. <clears throat> and when it... Ca oh, that's a, that's a lovely shot of Graham. I can just see in there, very reflective, looking out over Wellington Harbour, I imagine. I, I have yep. you. Th I have you this time. Um, okay. Yeah. No. So this, your your Scottish friend director, you're going to do a yeah, play. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to try and do a play with him. Mm. Um, that's n next year. Mm. Uh, but other than that, it it has been very very difficult. Mm. I used to do only theatre mm. uh, for a good ten years. All I did was theatre, mm. and I did you know many many plays, and it was fantastic. And I did my own play about Vincent van Gogh mm. that I toured um, all over the world in the end. And uh, it was, um, you know, it's one of the most enjoyable experiences I've ever had as an actor, actually. Mm. But, uh, yeah, I really want to get back into it. Yeah. And, and with, with your films and TVs, I mean, what sort of thing, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I, I the, the, the sort of film and TV shows that I look to do and I'm interested in doing are basically the ones that people hire me for. Um, but for someone like yourself, <laughs> they're, 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 you know, who can, who can afford to be a little bit more selective, what, what do you go for? What, what's the sort of things you like to do? Oh, well, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, 
I mean, that's nice of you to say that I, I can be more selective, but it's, uh, I'm, I've been really lucky, very lucky since The Hobbit that both Outlander and mm. now Preacher are based on enormously popular uh, books, mm. um, uh, like, well, like The Hobbit was. Yeah. Uh, and it means that uh, you've got a good source material to begin with, and uh, it's going to have a, 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 an inbuilt fan base, which yeah. is obviously helpful. Um, but I enjoy, I mean, with Preacher, um, I, um, I was a huge fan of those books, mm. graphic novels. Uh, I'd read them when they came out and the idea of being in it when I first heard about it I was just so determined to try and get in it yeah uh, and you know unfortunately you know the the conversations that I then had with the various people involved led me to to indeed get in a role in it um, mm. and and the role that I really wanted of the saint of killers um mm. so yeah that's just fortunate I like my own taste is uh i suppose cable tv because mm. i think they're just they're just more able to take risks yeah they do interesting things i think television we're going through a very very fortunate period with television um that there are so many shows now that i want to watch mm. uh and i can't remember a time before where mm. there, there was so much choice and of a really high standard and really interesting subject matter you, know, you think back to something like Breaking Bad. Mm. Um, I remember when I first saw that, I thought, how how would you even pitch that show? Mm. You know, to a studio executive. Mm. You know, this is a this is a story of a chemistry teacher yeah. who becomes a methamphetamine dealer yeah. uh, in order to um, look after his family because yeah. he has terminal cancer. Yeah, I mean that's such an extraordinary idea. And, and I think, uh, yeah, and I think the way they've gone, like from you know, where TV was was so much more episodic, you know, was you know, and then now, you know, they've serialized it because I was overhearing a conversation the other day about, you know, obviously now with all the different, net, you know, with Netflix and in Australia we've got Stan, we've got all these all these yeah. outlets now. People just want to watch it and they want to. It's like a movie. I mean, there there are more series that I want to watch now. Then there are yeah. movies, you know, there's, there's, there's so much more. Well, and you were able to tell a story over a longer period and in more detail, yeah. essentially. Yeah. You've got, um, you know, in the first season of Preacher, we had 10 hours to tell that story. Mm. The, the, the sort of as a prequel, really, to the to the rest of the story that will unfold over the over the following seasons. Yeah. And the same with Outlander. Outlander, we had 16 episodes. That's 16 hours of television to tell the story of the first book. Yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, to try and condense that book into a two, two and a half hour movie. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it would be interesting to speculate what something like The Hobbit would have been like if it had been done through the medium of television. Yeah. Uh, if it had been done as a 10 part miniseries, for instance. Well, it's interesting because someone's asked me, you know, they the questions we always get is like about the Silmarillion and obviously no one owns the rights to it. Pete's not going to go there, you know, yeah. but, you know, who knows in the future if someone takes something like that, if they're able to get, you know, rights to it, that would be something that you could, you know, use for that sort of form, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that, that really lends itself to it because of the way it's written as well. Yeah. Uh, you could just dip in and out <clears> and, and uh, I mean, you could do probably five or six seasons of television um hmm. Silmarillion. Uh, hmm. so yeah 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 but we're 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 lucky that we're around at the moment when hmm. television is uh, is so good yeah the board, really. and i i've been you know I, I teach students some acting students and also teach a bit of voiceover stuff as well and you know hmm. it's it's hard to break into that top level with a lot of things but the thing hmm. that i keep going back you know with them is that it's there's never been a more exciting time because like you know podcasts are exploding now you know you know like yeah. the days of the old radio plays are coming back and you know yeah. jermaine's got a really great one uncle bertie's um you know oh, Bonarium really? or something like that and you know but there's i think there's never been a time where there's there's places for creativity um whereas in yeah. the old days you'd have to go and you'd have to get on the main networks and it was impossible yeah. to, to break in um, yeah. So, so what advice would you give to you know creative people to to actors like now starting out? Gosh, um, yeah, I had a great piece of advice <laughs> that Steve Martin gives people. Yeah, and he said it's it's just really simple, but I think it's kind of brilliant. 
is just be better than everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, I mean, there's a there's a humor in that, but there's also a, a a kernel of truth in that. Be the best actor you can be, I suppose, and I mm. think that that comes from not necessarily, especially when you're starting out as an actor mm. and you may be waiting for work or whatever. Uh, is to not just sit around waiting for the phone to ring, to actually get out and do it yeah, and practice it. Like, you know, I, I did Craps Last Tape to sometimes one person uh, and, you know, they pay whatever it was they paid at the time. But I, I wasn't exactly making a living out of it. Hmm. Um, but I was prepared to do it because it, uh, in, the, in the act of doing it, uh, you learn a great deal. Hmm. And um, I don't think anything beats the practical experience of acting, particularly in theatre. Hmm. I think if you're able to, if you're lucky enough to do a season of plays at a theatre, hmm. even even if the money's not great or hmm. even if you're doing a play for no money hmm. in a little back out of the way place with your mates, that's better than waiting, hmm. just, just waiting for something to happen to you. Make it happen for yourself. Awesome. Or write write your own material, mm. perform your own material. Mm. Um, yeah, be proactive. I guess yeah. is the main bit of advice I would give. Awesome, uh, cool, yeah. mate. Well, I better let you get on with your day, and I need to go yes. for a wee. Yes, I mean, so, I, um, I need to put some clothes on because yeah. I, it's quite chilly. I need to go to the bathroom, and it's a lot harder without pants to try and hold it in. So um, it, it 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 is, and and that, that whole egg diet that you've been <clears> on for the last several years yeah can't be helping with that yes oh and just just before we go just one little side note um when i called you earlier you were having your protein shake um how are the protein shakes i remember uh eating some sort of biscuit in santa monica with you once and what what was in that i still don't know because it still makes me want to go to the toilet just thinking about it it was this it was essentially sort of ground up monkey glands um that then sort of mashed up and uh just add a little bit of you know, sugar, some some nuts, but the emphasis is on the monkey glands. Yeah, and that's what uh, you know. A lot of people think about protein powder and everything, but if you can get hold of a monkey, get its glands. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but even before I even took a mouthful, I wanted to go to the bathroom, and and I don't think that toilet has ever recovered from it. Well, on that note, <laughs> it's been a pleasure talking about ourselves. Cheers, always. Mate. Thanks, Graham <laughs> McDavish. All right, mate. <laughs> Those breakfast pancakes, I just had to look at them and I'd immediately had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, I think the whole of um, that part of Santa Monica is still in lockdown. <laughs> they're, they're, trying to, they're just trying to find the source <laughs> of the problem. <laughs> Yeah, nah, sweet.